Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're so grateful to have so many of you joining us today for our session on getting from here to there, how to leverage change is an opportunity to redefine your identity. Um, we're so grateful that so many people were interested in today's topic, and I know people are still joining, but we are here at the top of the hour. So let's get started. Our speaker today is back by popular demand. It's Jacob Astley with the Oklahoma State University Foundation. And my name is Katherine Bergerson. I am the Vice President of Marketing with the Insightful Team. We are happy to have so many of you again here joining us today. I uh, wanted to let you know as we kick things off here that the session is recorded. You will receive a copy via email. And on our agenda today, I'm just going to share a quick little bit of background um, on Insightful, and then we're going to jump into the program, getting from here to there and managing change. We will be happy to take your questions. Jacob will pause throughout his presentation. If you, depending on the version of GoToWebinar you're using, you may see gray bars that say questions or chat. Just click on those. It'll open up. You can type it in there or you may have icons along the left side of your screen. Um, there's like an a icon bubble that you can type in questions, or there's the download section um, where you can download handouts. So um, again, we will pause. We want your questions. We want it to be an interactive session. We'll do our best to get to all of them. If we run short on time, we do commit to getting back to you in the very near future. Bit of background on Insightful. Insightful is powered by our parent company, NewsBank. And NewsBank is a leading news and information provider aggregating sources from all around the world, bringing your team's access to credible, vetted global news sources, many of which are unique to NewsBank and Insightful. And they are all available. 24 hours a day, seven days a week from any device. So in today's remote world, whether you're um, in the office, if you're at home, you're at the library, your connection to Insightful is there for you. And we're proud to share with you that NewsBank recently celebrated our 51st anniversary as a company. So Insightful is part of NewsBank's philanthropy division, and this is a new software that draws on NewsBank's resources to help nonprofits fill in information gaps, know more about donors and prospects in order to better promote philanthropic engagement. And it's really, it's really this simple. When you know more, you can deepen donor relationships and you can raise more money to do more good in the world for your mission. So the reason that we are all here today is change management, how to get from here to there. And if you're like me, when you heard this topic, you might have had to take a deep breath. Well, fortunately, leading the discussion today, again, is Jacob Astley. He serves as the Assistant Vice President of Prospect Development at Oklahoma State University Foundation. And in this role, Jacob oversees prospect research, prospect engagement teams. He partners with the foundation's development team to really ensure a continuous flow of information of promising prospects um, so that development officers have the information and the portfolios that they need to be successful. Jacob holds a bachelor's degree in English from the University of Science and Arts in Oklahoma. He lives in Perkins, Oklahoma with his wife, three kids, and their numerous cats and dogs. And we are fortunate to have this successful leader in big change management getting from here to there. Leveraging change is an opportunity to redefine your identity. Please join me in welcoming Jacob Astley. Welcome back, Jacob. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah, it seems like new cats and dogs appear every day. So I had to stop counting them. I just put numerous now. So uh, <laughs> thank you. And I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, yeah, to have another opportunity to kind of talk through some stuff. Um, and it's something that I really, um, let me one moment, please, while I get situated here. There we go. Looking good? Yep, your screen, we can hear you all as well. Perfect, well settle in because oh, I've run through this presentation before, it's always coming at 33 minutes. And so if anybody wants to keep score at home or start their stopwatch, please do. But um, this, 
this slide, this presentation has gone through some interesting iterations over the years. Um, it's actually, I originally presented this back in 2020, October of 2020, October, November of 2020. Um, whenever we were going through our CRM implementation and it was before is actually right whenever we were starting the implementation. And so having the opportunity to revisit this presentation after four years, um, I, I thought maybe there'd be a lot I would change. Um, I, I thought, okay, when this was put together, um, you know, four years ago, I know more now than I knew then. And we've gone through, we've had a successful implementation with our CRM. We went through big changes in how we do our business and prospect development here at OSU. So I'm gonna have a lot of new content. And the interesting thing was, I did tweak some things, of course. I, I, I did make some adjustments, but the fundamentals were still the same. And that was that was kind of validating to me that there wouldn't be a ton I would do differently. Um, you know, hindsight's 2020, but in terms of the principles that we're gonna to discuss today, really didn't change much. Um, so that was, Again, I appreciate this opportunity to walk through this and also to have this opportunity to revisit change management, which if you were to tell me years ago that I'd be giving a presentation on change management, I don't know if I would have believed you, but <laughs> this is the world that we live in. And um, it's a fast moving world. And uh, as kind of whatever this uh, presentation was announced, you're, you're gonna have to work through change either way. So you might as well take advantage of it. And appreciate it. Like Catherine said, the first reaction is to take a deep breath. But then what do you do after you take that deep breath, right? Um, I do want to acknowledge before we get into this, uh, current and former process development team members that all contributed to the concepts and executed on the concepts that we're going to discuss today. Um, it is truly a team effort and you don't, <laughs> hopefully, you're not going through any big changes alone. Hopefully you have a team around you and at least a couple of people that will support you and allow you to bounce ideas off of them. So I want to give a shout out to those folks um, before we get into this. Oklahoma State University, for those of you that are not aware, we really love orange here. Uh, so you'll see a lot of orange, America's brightest orange, I should say, throughout this presentation. Um, Oklahoma State University is located in beautiful Stillwater, Oklahoma. We will be hosting the Big 12 Development Conference here in Stillwater um, in June. So if you haven't signed up for that, please do. Um, but we are, Oklahoma State is a land grant university founded on Christmas Day in 1890. What a, what a Christmas gift to Oklahoma and to the world. And we're located about 60 miles, uh, equal distance pretty much between Oklahoma City and Tulsa. And we have 24,000 students in 265,000 living alumni. And each time I see that number, I think, I think it may be closer to 275,000 now. Um, but anyway, a lot, of, a lot of alumni scattered around the world. I'm a part of Oklahoma State University Foundation. We are a separate 501c3. Um, our, our mission is to unite donor passions with university priorities to elevate the impact of Oklahoma State University. We have about 160 staff members, of which more than 50 are development officers. And I do think I need to update this number too. I think it's probably closer to 60 because we are getting gearing up for a big campaign. Um, that's more change, by the way. And the prospect development team itself, if you, if you don't include me, um, and I, I consider myself the least important uh, member of the team, we have two prospect researchers, two prospect members of project engagement, and that's pretty much our project management team, and then one team member who's our utility player who bounces between prospect research and prospect engagement. So with that out of the way, with that introduction out of the way, we're gonna talk about change. <laughs> um, you know, the impetus for this presentation, of course, was CRM conversion, and I will get into some of what we did specifically, of course. I do wanna share some specific examples of how we use that as an opportunity to implement some changes to our business processes. And, and as a result, really kind of change the identity of how we handle process management here at the foundation. But also, I'm not gonna go into a super deep technical dive about that either. So I do wanna say, if you're interested in hearing more specifics about our CRM implementation, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn, shoot me an email. Uh, I'm always happy to talk about that uh, because even though we'll get into kind of timeline of our implementation, we're you go live with your implementation and then you're still implementing. <laughs> it's kind of how it works. Um, but the CRM implementation is certainly a, implement a project that would meet these criteria right here. Um, 
we're, we all encounter these kinds of projects where it's it's outside of the norm. You know, you have your kind of run the mill garden variety projects that you can knock out in a few weeks, a couple of months. But then there are those projects that disrupt your normal way of doing business. Once it starts, CRM implementations, <laughs> you still are doing your job. And you're also going to be working on all the stuff that a CRM implementation entails. So you're going to be, this is a project that you still do your normal job, but you're also going to have to do this additional work. And so that's a disruption and requires unusually large amounts of time and energy to finish and will fundamentally and permanently change your day-to-day -day activity once it is completed. If you're working on a project or you have a project coming down the pike that meets those three criteria, you probably got a big change opportunity on the horizon. We, a little bit of a history on our uh, CRM implementation. We had been on our legacy CRM, Razor's Edge, for 12 years, and it served us very well. And a, a whole ecosystem sprung up around Razor's Edge to kind of help us do our work, get the reports that we needed, so on and so forth. But after about 12 years, with you know anticipating some changes in campus leadership and within the foundation, also the fact that we we're going to be launching, we ended our previous campaign, Branding Success, in 2014. We did some mini campaigns since then, but we knew that at the turn of the decade, I'm, I'm talking, you know, you kind of look at the timeline there, we kicked off in July 2020, but we really were assessing the need for a CRM implementation, kind of the latter parts, latter years of the last decade. Yeah, you know, we needed something different, something new um, to really give us the tools that would help us execute a larger campaign. Because, as you know, with campaigns, you never go smaller in terms of your goal. Um, so our CRM implementation officially began in July 2020, and the prospect research and prospect management portions of the implementation took place in the fall of that year. And so I was speaking a little bit at the start of this about when this presentation was originally given, and it was during that time. Go live with our new CRM was in early 2022. So we're just over two years post go live, and it feels like it was just yesterday. Um, yeah, we knew this was coming up. We on the process development team knew this was coming up. And, you know, certainly there's anxiety around the work this will entail. And it's anxiety throughout the organization because everybody's life is going to be impacted by this. But, you know, you kind of have that initial anxiety and then you take a step back and, and you're like, you know, man, there's some stuff that's been bugging us for a while now that we could probably address through this big change, through the CRM implementation. And, you know, thinking about kind of the way the world is now with artificial intelligence, with leadership changes, with all sorts of shifting, that's... Yes, change is scary, but it's also an opportunity really to address some issues um, that have been kind of bugging you for a while and that you knew, you know need to be fixed, but are kind of hard to fix in the day-to-day -day activities that you do. And so it does bring that opportunity to introduce new processes, approach things that were challenging to implement before, and to say goodbye to those old processes that you really needed, needed to get rid of but never really could find the time. So. The prospect development team kind of sat down and said, okay, let's map this out from a high level strategic view. How can we, and we called it eating the elephant, which is gross, <laughs> but that was, we kept saying the, the metaphor was eating the elephant. If you had to eat an elephant, you know, you can't eat it all at once. You have to take some bites here, some bites here. I'm sorry, it is gross. Can't believe I'm getting that on recording. But if you try to do it all at once, you're going to overwhelm yourself. And, and, you will so overwhelm yourself that nothing will happen or you won't be able to affect change to the levels that you really, in your heart, you know you need to. So we said, okay, let's let's start with visioning. Let's just kind of, you know, have a, have a step where you're brainstorming, it's fun, you're like, oh, cool, we're moving to Salesforce platform. What are, what are all the neat things we could do? Let's hop in and do some trailheads, you know, and by the way, you know, with the Salesforce, you know, with Salesforce, they have a ton of free, kind of, they call them trailheads, ways you can edu educate yourself about a Salesforce platform. There's a ton of great material out there, and it really helps get the gears turning about possibilities. And you don't want to in the visioning stage, and we'll, we'll go into in-depth on each of these steps, but a key thing is, is truly, really try to adhere to, there are no bad ideas. Let's go ahead and document everything. 
And then assessment is where you start, you know, really kind of narrowing in on what you want to address. That's that's where you, you can bring a little bit of reality into the fun stuff that you're doing during the visioning. Vision re refinement is where you further sand down what you're hoping to accomplish, and then action is where you make that change a reality. And I do have to say, because I like to think I'm a creative person and I really do have fun in brainstorming sessions, the visioning part was by far my favorite part of this. It's who are you and who do you want to be? It's almost like who do you want to be when you grow up, right? You're like, okay, I know this is who I am now, but who do I hope that we are after we go through this big change? So really the best way to start with that is to conduct a self-assessment figure out what your biggest pain points are these are a few that were tossed around during our visioning session and i think that first one is good lord that's a tale as old as time <laughs> you know our, do our development officers aren't documenting their activity and contact reports the second one you know portfolios were way too large and we knew that for a long time and trying to work the development officers let folks go was I'm not going to say an exercise in futility because I do think it laid the groundwork for helping making the change that we are hoping to see through the CRM implementation actually take effect. But it was very frustrating because the, pro the portfolios were too big and we'll get into this. And it was really, really a difficult conversation to get folks to really drop uh, prospects they weren't working with. And that ties into that. Our prospects not receiving adequate attention. And also, there was little to no documented prospect strategy in our kind of our the CRM, the legacy, what we call now the legacy CRM, but at the time, Razor's Edge. This is an illustration that we would show in our portfolio optimization meetings of development officers about what happens when you're not moving prospects through the gift cycle? What happens whenever portfolios are too large? You can't really see who you have in your portfolio. You can't really know who it is that you're meaningfully working with. And so we'd say, look, the idea is to make your portfolio like the koi pond. I don't know how this is displaying for those of you watching this, <laughs> but on the left is no churn, which is the gross overgrown pond. And then on the right is the koi pond with the goldfish, which are swimming around. And what we'd say is basically, you know, that waterfall in the back is new prospects coming in, that those goldfish, which are very healthy looking goldfish, kind of going in circles looks like maybe swimming in circles and so that's that's your that's your primary prospects moving through the gift cycle and in those moments development officers would get it they'd be like yeah I, I see what you're saying but as soon as they left the meeting room it's kind of slipping back into old habits and it you just felt like you're repeating that cycle over and over again and so we started drafting out kind of some things that we like, okay, we, we, these are pain points. What are other shops doing? So, you know, shout out to APRA, APRA conference, good Lord. <laughs> you can't do better than going to that because you get, you get ideas from shops of all sizes. You get shop ideas from shops that, are, kind of, that you're, are your peers in terms of staff size, in terms of alumni. If you're at a, at a higher ed uh, fundraising shop, you know, it, it's just, the ideas that you get really help with that ideation that you do during visioning. And you can note common themes. You know, one of the common themes that we really narrowed in on was smaller portfolios. It's somewhat embarrassing for me to say this and admit this, but we had some portfolios that were well over 100. <laughs> um, and, it, you know, what we'd hear from both peers in the industry and from aspirational shops was, you know, do your best to kind of trim those down. Uh, really, who, who are those folks that they're working with? Um, and so those themes started to bubble up, you know, and they have to be things that you feel like fit with the identity that you want to be after this change is done. It's like, you know, we do want to be, you know, efficient and really moving folks through the gift cycle um, and just kind of focusing on the best prospects. And so over time, those themes did bubble up and the list, as it were, of things that we hope to accomplish really started to become smaller. Use this information from your self-assessment and those best practices to determine your true north. So what are your fundamentals? Because whenever the project really kicks into gear, you're gonna be faced with a lot of choices. And you have to have that north star, those, those true norths to say, okay, whenever you come to a fork in the road, which direction are you going to go in? 
These are our true norths. And especially that top one is very much in line with what you saw at the beginning of this presentation about what the foundation's mission is, is un uniting donors with university priorities. And so, I mean, you know, be centered and focused on the donor, on the donor's experience, on what it's like to work with us from a philanthropic standpoint. Always keep the donor top of mind. Development officer centered. Yeah, we are a service department, <laughs> so the work for the development officers and, you know, they are the ones that are directly interacting with the donors. Um, if we're not centered on the development officer and their experience, then what are we doing, <laughs> right? Um, and so that's always, those, those two items are always top of mind. It really feeds into that third item. How can we make fundraising easy? And that's really, that last one is the one that we still say, you know, now that, you know, we're, we're through the CRM implementation. We're trying to get campaign ready now. So we're having to continue this pace of change that we started with the CRM implementation. We do reach those forks in the road. And actually, we're going through business planning right now, by the way. I think you have to do a lot of shops probably in March. Business planning is top of mind if you're on a, you know, July 1st to June 30th uh, calendar. What can we do to make fundraising easier? going into the next year um, and we say that a lot we actually have a whiteboard it's written on there make fundraising easy so with your best practices and true north selected you start focusing in on those key change items what do you want to address you know i talked a lot about stagnant portfolios um, we had what were called in, in razor's edge unit pools and it was a great concept it was Basically, every fundraising unit, College of Arts and Sciences, College of Business, would have a unit pool associated with them. And basically, if you proposed a, a good, viable prospect to that development team, you know, say for Arts and Sciences, and the Arts and Sciences team were like, you know, look, I don't have space in my portfolio right now, but let's put them in the unit pool. We'll, we'll get to them eventually. That's, that's what would happen. <laughs> And what we found over the years was that eventually wouldn't come. It's always, you know, that those pools will continue growing and the development officers are so focused on their own portfolios that the unit pools would stagnate. You know, there were, there were a couple of instances where the unit pools were fairly well maintained, but the, the overwhelming majority <laughs> were the, that gross overgrown pond that I showed in the illustration earlier and like I would say, as we were having these conversations about offloading those unit pools, one or two exceptions, we, we can't build out a system to those exceptions. It's obvious that the current system is not working. And so what was proposed was if you're going to take somebody on assignment, they had to be assigned to a human being because that's being donor centered. That means there's actually a human being looking at that prospect that's moving that prospect through the gift cycle tossing somebody into a unit pool and it was with the best of intentions intentions but what it ended up, ended up happening was they were out of sight out of mind and um we're just like look we, we can't continue down that same road uh in the new crm also i mentioned earlier there was a lack of documented strategy in the legacy crm around exactly what the plan was for the prospect and so he said, look, if you're going to take somebody on cultivation assignment, you have to have a strategy entered in the system. And if you were to do that, they would automatically be moved to the cultivation stage. It was something that we built out within the system was to make the system data driven. You enter in a strategy, you have yourself as uh, the primary relationship manager that would automatically go into cultivation assignment stage. And the reason it was important to have them in cultivation assignment stage was because for discovery stage, which is basically the qualification stage. Are, are they a viable major gift prospect for Oklahoma State University? Do they have interest in giving to us? That assessment stage, what we call discovery here at OSU Foundation, had an auto drop system put into place where, you know, there was no contact within 60 days, no email, no phone call, no personal visit. The CRM would automatically pull them out of assignment. And we call that the auto drop. You can see that uh, if you went to the, the prospect's record, they've been auto dropped before, you would see that as a reason for removal and the name of that previous manager that the prospect was auto dropped from their portfolio from. 
Um, these are big changes. In, in Razor's Edge, every request for assignment went through prospect development for approval. Um, every contact report was reviewed before it went into the system. Every proposal was reviewed before it went to the, into the system. And kind of what the identity that we wanted to change was moving the team from being just so focused on moving data from point A to point B. What we wanted to be when we went to the new CRM was a partner with development officers rather than always you know, cor correcting grammatical errors in contact reports. You know, hey, this person's requesting assignment. There's already somebody on the assignment team. Let me go reach out to the person already on the assignment team to get that approval, kind of acting as a go-between there. We wanted to give more agency and control to development officers to really own their portfolios, but we also wanted to make sure there were guardrails in place. We called it self-service with guardrails. Um, Hence the fact that we have an auto drop in place. Hence the fact that it's expected you enter a strategy into the system. Prospect development still, we, we have quite a few audits. <laughs> That's probably a separate presentation that we run to kind of, you know, just assess things and keep an eye on things. Um, but development officers had asked for a while that they wanted more self-service. We wanted more self-service for them because it gave more bandwidth to the team to have meaningful conversations around strategy to really assess portfolio health in a meaningful way. And to do that, we had to make those big changes. Catherine, are there any questions? I thought I'd pause here. Thank you. Yeah, this is a great, a great opportunity to pause. Thank you so much, Jacob. These are really great insights. Um, I'd like to remind people, if you have a question, uh, just tap on that gray bar that says either question or chat, or there may be icons and, um, you can enter them in there. So far, we don't have any questions, but we'll pause again in a few moments. So send them on in. Thanks. All right. Well, we'll keep moving. This is a fun one. Assessment, figuring out the lay of the land. You know, the, the kind of key thing is, you know, especially when you're going through the, the visioning stage, is you anecdotally know what the issues are. And the organization generally knows what the issues are too, but when it comes time to really advocate for some meaningful change, you will be asked to provide data supporting those claims. And it's a reasonable request. It's, it really is. It's, it's like you're, you're trying to be, to make an impartial assessment, uh, you know, that yes, we need to kind of up in some of our processes here. Um, and you want to be very deliberate about that and ensure that the data is seeing the same things that you have been seeing anecdotally. So you will at some point have to present these change recommendations to leadership. So that data confirmation is incredibly important. And it's also important to have specific examples as well. This is a screenshot of one of those unit pools uh, that I was speaking about earlier. If you're, if you're watching any presentation from Oklahoma State University, the color orange is always a good color. The more orange, <laughs> the better something is doing. Um, and so in this screenshot, the fact that you only see tiny slivers of orange, you know, in terms of last contact with this unit pool and in terms of last visit uh, with this, you know, the prospects in this unit pool, the fact that those slivers of orange are so tiny is not a good sign. Um, this, this, Honestly, offlining the unit pools was not a hard conversation because we basically just showed, this is pulled from one of our Tableau reports. Yeah, look, <laughs> we all know this is an issue here. We have over 200 people assigned here and they're not getting any attention whatsoever. The, no, the amount of attention that they're getting is just so small, it might as well be non-existent. Honestly, that last contact is probably a few folks in the unit pool got some birthday cards or holiday cards. Um, it's just frankly embarrassing. So that was a quick conversation. And if, you know, again, it's not a ton of data. It's, it's easy to consume. You know, executives are very busy. They, they the, my VP always tells me, I, I generally like three to five bullet points and I get that, <laughs> you know, it's like distill things down. If you can visualize some stuff, that's even better. You also want to conduct a listening tour of your development officers. Um, especially if you're in a service department like mine is. Not only does this feedback bolster your case for change, but something that I found 
and I, and I probably should have kind of really emphasized this with the, as a bullet point itself is I found the development officers just really appreciated being asked. Um, I got a little bit of pushback on conducting the assessment initially because it was it turned into well, Jacob, what if they request something and we're not able to do it? <laughs> my, my pushback was, look, I think people just like being heard, and I think folks are reasonable. They get that you know they we can't do everything. You know, the, they they get that. Um, at the end of the day, what they appreciate is like, hey, thank you for giving me an opportunity to provide feedback. Um, you know, I just, I'm really just, just listening and being very intentional about that and being authentic whenever you say, yeah, I'm going to document what you're asking for. There's no guarantees about what we can execute in the implementation, but I'll keep you posted. Um, people were cool with that. <laughs> so, um, the, the survey that was sent out was not long, kind of going back to the, don't make it more than three to five points. I, I really adhere to that um, in terms of the survey. What are your biggest pain points? What do you most want to see in the new CRM? Um, and it helps ensure we don't lose sight of fundamentals. What are your guiding principles? What do you really look for whenever you're assessing a promising prospect and managing a, a, a prospect through the gift cycle? And if anybody's curious about any specifics from the survey results, again, feel free to reach out to me. I, I look at them. This was done in the summer of 2020, right before we went, um, we started, we kicked off the implementation. It was actually also, this was a course during lockdown. It was just a good opportunity just to reach out to people and see how they're doing too. But um, I'm happy to share kind of anonymized details of what, we, what kind of feedback we got. The interesting thing to me was there wasn't really any 80% or 90% of people ask for this. It, it was fairly split, but at the end of the day, they wanted a CRM that was easy to navigate. They didn't want to have to drill down a ton for information. In terms of prospect identification fundamentals, I always think it's funny. I've been I've been in the prospect research field for 15 years. Actually, I'm going to, this is my 16th year in the field. <laughs> Time flies and you're having fun. Um, for as long as I've been in the field, it's like development officers will, will often say to me, hey, this, this rating is wrong. They, they say all ratings are wrong, but yet they love their capacity ratings too. It's like this interesting dichotomy to me. Um, but they want to they look at capacity rating, wealth indicators, and also giving. Um, those are kind of rating and giving are the two key indicators they look for. And they really wanted, you know, this wasn't like an overwhelming majority, but this has been something that's been requested. And we're still trying to get into place in our new CRM a robust notification system. We've made some headway here, but this is also an area where we're still looking at refining and, and continuing to build out. So this was, wasn't anything surprising, um, you know, but it, it's, it's helpful to have. And like I said, the actual feedback that I got is something that I still look at on a regular basis. Um, you know, easy to navigate, want to be able to quickly see untapped pockets of potential. It alerts, development officers, you know, love their alerts. Also, sometimes we'll complain there's too many alerts. So we're still, again, trying trying to dial that in. But they really did appreciate that feedback because this change was going to affect them too. They had their own anxieties about this, about how they're going to work within the system. So once you have all of that, you're starting to put things together. It does feel like you're putting a big, giant puzzle together. And this is where you start refining your plan, um, how you're going to present this to leadership, how you're going to present this during a CRM implementation where the technical team is like, okay, you say you want this, how are we going to figure this out? This is where you sand the rough edges off of your vision. And a key part of that is keeping your vision focused. Quantity does not equal quality. This is something I struggle with. I, I, I'm big on the quantity piece because I'm always thinking of something else. I'm like, man, it'd be awesome if we could do this too. I really, and this is where my team helped me too, really focused in and said, no, let's keep it simple as much as possible because these are going to be big changes. Maybe only three things, but it's going to fundamentally change how we approach our work. The type of change that is the impetus for this is very important. If you're moving to a new CRM, yes, it'll have a ton of new capabilities, but there's going to be limitations too. And it's good to be aware of that from the outset because that will also help you dial in exactly what you're ask, asking for. It may be like, 
yeah, we could do this, but there's limited bandwidth where we had to move through a sprint system or, or however you're managing this big project. Do you want to bog down a ton, ton of time and resources on this, or do you want to focus in on that? You're going to have a lot of those kinds of conversations. Also, if you're getting a new CEO or leadership team member, you have to keep them in mind too. They're going to have their own philosophies. We actually, in the time period that we changed CRMs, we got a new president of our foundation and also a new university president came in as well. And they were totally on board with a lot of what we wanted to do, but it was also a matter of, okay, this is where we're at. This is the kind of input we're getting. Yes, we're getting feedback from development officers. This isn't just prospect development saying, you know, uh, you know, kind of hoarding this whole process, um, but also these new leaders had their own thoughts too. And if you keep things dialed in and focused, it's easier to navigate these conversations and make them a reality. So you have to get that leadership buy-in, be ready, at least in my case, for quite a few presentations of leadership. And again, if it's focused and clear, then it's easier to have these presentations and these conversations. Ensure there's a clear path for how to make the change happen. Ensure that change is sustainable and address the what ifs heads head on. And you know, we did get pushed back on entering a strategy for everybody in your portfolio. Um, that one was, you know, basically the conversation was, look, <laughs> yeah, it could seem like a lot of work at the outset. But if you're finding it's a lot of work to enter strategies on 120 people in your portfolio, then you probably don't need 120 people in your portfolio. It was really simple as that. Um, David Lively, whose book, uh, Managing Major Gift Fundraisers, uh, was something that we actually, <laughs> we had a copy of that uh, book as we were going through this process. And we, we referenced that thing. We called it the Book of Lively. It was well worn by the end of this. But I think I believe it's in this book that he says, you know, treat your prospects like projects. They are each, they each have their own kind of expectations. Um, you have to work with them in a very distinct and unique ways. And whenever you view prospects in that fashion, then your portfolio will become more focused. And, and so we brought a lot of that kind of language into the conversations too. Um, also, whenever we were offlining the unit pools, whenever we were instituting the auto drop, there was a lot of concern about, well, this is going to lead to prospects falling off the radar. You know, I want to keep my, I want to keep my portfolio this size because it helps me pay attention to them. You know, there's this whole kind of interesting psychological game that happens where they feel like development officers feel like, okay, I got them in my portfolio, so that means that yeah, I'm not working with them necessarily, but I have them on the radar. But what ended up happening, especially with the unit pools, was that good prospects are already falling through the cracks. It was actually worse than if they were unassigned because, at least in the legacy CRM, they were technically assigned to a unit pool. So they would not show up in lists of unassigned prospects. And so, in a lot of ways, it was worse than them being out in the wild. And it's also interesting, and I don't know if this is true at other shops, but it's almost like when you're having a conversation with an officer about dropping someone from their portfolio, it's it almost like they felt like if they were pulled out of their portfolio, then they were like deleted from the system. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh my gosh, no, I have to keep them in my portfolio or else they'll be completely forgotten. Um, and we're like, no, we'll, we'll run audits, we'll run reports. You just trust us. If you feel like you're walking on a tight wire, you know, a high variety, uh, high wire, like you're in a circus, tightrope, I guess is the word, or the net underneath you <laughs> to help ensure that these good prospects aren't going to fall through the cracks. Also, we have plenty of living alumni, and I always like to say there's a new OSU alum striking our bench every day. <laughs> you know, we don't have to worry about running out of good prospects anytime soon. So now you execute, right? You go through the, our implementation was 18 months. Um, you make it a reality. And this is what I found, and this is actually one of those slides where I thought I would have a lot to add to it because I did put it together kind of in the thick of our uh, sprints, our sprint cycle. I didn't change much on this. Um, you know, there were, you know, there were definitely attempts to relitigate decisions then, and there were attempts to relitigate decisions after we went live. There are still attempts to relitigate decisions. Um, but something that I found was 
that is that is a very massive time sink. And if you're very deliberate, if you'll recall that earlier slide of um, those four stages that you go through, the vision stage, the assessment stage, the refinement stage, you don't need to litigate the decisions anymore. <laughs> What you run into is the fact that some things may seem like, okay, yeah, we can live with that whenever you're still, whenever it's still conceptual before you've gone live with your new CRM and really execute the change. But whenever you actually have made the change, that's whenever the cold feet sets, settles in. And that's a natural human reaction because human beings resist change even if it will benefit them. I keep thinking of my in-laws who kept resisting using a smartphone, <laughs> even though it would make their life much easier. You could drop the landline, trust me. They're, the phone companies are running out of people that know how to work on landlines. Um, and really, it's, it's, it's a good thing, but man, you know, it's, it's hard to change, even if it will benefit you. I actually, right before the presentation, was trying to use a new version of Outlook, and I switched back to the classic version, even though I know that I would be forced to use the new version of Outlook at some point. And it's because it's change, and change is hard, and people naturally resist it, even when it will benefit them. The bigger the change you're advocating, the bigger the moments of second guess, and we kind of touched on that. It's part of the process. I'm going to skip this next bullet point, because actually, I think in the ordering of this, um, this makes more sense. Document the rationale for every decision. Anybody that knows me knows I take a ton of notes. And it can seem like a lot of work in the moment. But I'm so grateful that I have this tendency to write everything down, write down who was in the meeting, write down the date of the meeting. Because, good golly, you think you'll remember something, but then something else comes up and that memory begins to fade. And you may be hit after, you know, after go live, Wait a minute, so people that take prospects on assignment on their own? Yes, yes, that is part of the process. They have self-service now. This was discussed. Here's where we presented on it. Here's the presentation. Here are the notes. Here are the guardrails we put in place. We have the auto drop. We have the expectation you enter a purpose and a strategy every time you take someone on assignment. And by the way, prospect development is monitoring for any goofiness. <laughs> um, that was a big one that we did get cold feet on quite a bit. And it was interesting because even I started to get cold feet, but then I go back and re revisit the notes from those conversations. And, and I'm like, and one of my team members, Jeff Grizzle, you know, he would say, look, Jacob, the world isn't falling. <laughs> the, the sun is still shining. The you know, people are starting to get used to the new system. And after about six months to a year, Everyone starts settling into that new way of doing things, and it's not as much of a hot topic. We have tweaked a few things, but people still have that self-service in place. Um, we basically tweaked how some of that assignment data displays, how some of that process works, but the, the fundamental is still in place. And going back a little bit of just to the previous bullet point in the list, Broaching a topic is enough of a win sometimes. Um, I'm thinking specifically of topics like shared credit, which is a very sensitive topic. That was broached during the implementation. We're still discussing it. We're still refining it. Um, actually, I was in a meeting this morning advocating for potentially some change in how we handle some metrics. Definitely got some pushback with that. I'm glad the topic was broached. You know, it was at least, you know, the material has been shared with the leaders that were in the room. Once you've kind of gotten through that initial conversation, sometimes folks will step away and kind of think about it, have time to mull it over, and it's a little bit easier to bring it up again later because you've already gone through that initial, kind of that initial questioning and, and pushback you sometimes give when you're, when you're advocating for a big change. Uh, so if you feel like you've broached a big change topic and you didn't get the traction you wanted, be great. You know, you're putting yourself out there, right? You're putting yourself out there, you're stepping into the arena, you're, you're having that conversation. And like I said, Change is hard, even when it will help folks. And sometimes just getting that topic out there, pat yourself on the back if you've done that and you didn't get the results you wanted because you may get the results you wanted. It just may be a little while from now. So maybe some other things have to fall into place before you can really do that. It's okay to have your moments of doubt. Don't, don't wallow in them though. You know, I always like to say, start fresh the next day. You're gonna have your rough days. Everybody has them. Just start fresh the next day and don't judge a process until it's finished. Like I was talking about earlier, you know, especially with our self-service with assignments, 
you know, and I think Jeff, he, he, he had that, he, he had that check moment for me. He's like, Hey man, let's let the process play out a little bit. And that was exactly the right move. And speaking of Jeff, shout out to him. I don't know if he's on the call or not, but uh, he's, he's, he's the meme king. We like to say on the team, he always has a perfect meme or gif. Um, and these were some of the ones that he kind of pushed out to the team and we adopted for our team's backgrounds. We are a Microsoft team shop. Uh, because they addressed specific things that happened during the course of this big change. <sighs> Whether consciously or subconsciously, there were there are attempts, I think a lot of them were subconscious, to recreate the legacy CRM. So we had that just say no legacy 2.0. You know, it rhymes <laughs> and it's very catchy. Just say no legacy 2.0 as much as possible. And then trust the process was one that I actually had as a team's background quite a bit, especially in early conversations. Additionally, no sacred cows. I found both of them pretty funny, so they have them on here. We have the we have the cow with the halo that has the no sign, um, and then also there's the awesome hair cow, the, the the cow that looks like the lead singer of White Snake or some '80s hair band. He cracks me up, and so I like to use his background quite a bit. We also have Linus with the blanket, and that's don't cling to the way we've always done things. And then finally, this gentleman from Office Space. If you've ever seen Office Space, he looks eerily like my father. And I remember when Office Space came out, my dad worked at Fort Sill um, in southwestern Oklahoma. If anybody's gone through basic training in the Army, they've likely gone through Fort Sill at some time. The uh, we were in office space came out in the late 90s. A lot of the, the guys at Fort Sill gave my dad a hard time. We're like, hey, Carl, you need to watch office space because there's a guy in there that looks exactly like you. But that character in office space, I can't remember his name. Um, he had a board game called Jump to Conclusions, which I recall the other character saying that's the worst idea ever. I think he did strike it rich at the end of the movie with this idea. I forgot, like, I don't know, it's been a bit since I've seen the movie, but. Jumping, jumping to conclusions happens so much. And it seems like the conclusions a lot of folks will jump to is always the worst possible outcome. So we did have a saying, okay, you've told me the worst that can happen. What's the best that can happen? And, and that's something I try to be cognizant of in those moments. I'm not always, again, great at that. But if I, if I have my wits about me, I'm like, okay, cool. We've, we've run through the list of the 10 worst things that could happen. What are some of the good things that could happen? Um, because there is that natural tendency to um you know jump to the worst possible outcome so coming up on i don't know how long i've been presenting for probably more than 33 minutes this is the final slide and i did i'm a big fan of mythology classical works i always think of the myth of sisyphus rolling the boulder up the mountain you get the boulder up there and then it rolls back down you gotta start over again and um i think that this is something that we're probably all feeling to some some in some form or fashion I, I think of even myself but yeah i think it's last year or the year before i think it's like november of uh i don't know maybe november 2022 or maybe even early 2023 whenever chat gpt really rolled out open ai really became open to everybody and it was just one of those moments kind of like i remember new york times called it the netflix i mean the no the Netflix, the, uh, you know, Netflix was another disruptor, but the uh, Netscape moment from the mid 90s, uh, whenever the internet really came on the scene, the internet had been around some form or fashion, especially in the military, you know, back in the 80s. But, you know, the mid 90s is like, oh my gosh, anybody can get on this thing. And the effects were just seismic. I feel like AI is kind of that same thing. We're still figuring out how to work with it, but there's seismic effects leading to a lot of change. And you know, folks are trying to absorb that change while they're having to adjust to a new leader or, or convert to a new CRM. So, you know, like the thesis of this presentation, as painful as it can be, it's got some opportunities. What's the best that can happen? Um, and that's really, the, I think, the best mindset to go into these with. So with that, that's it for me. Open to questions now. Um, I know we covered a lot, and feel free to, uh, of course, you know, reach out to me offline, follow up with me. I'm always happy to chat, hop on a Teams call or a Zoom call uh, because we're all going through this together. Oh, thank you so much, Jacob. And and you know, you really mean it when when you make those offers. I I speak from experience, so thank you so much for those fabulous insights and. Um, we have a new connection point with uh, you know our many other <laughs> college who we're rooting for in college and, and Super Bowl. Office Space is my 
favorite movie of all time. Oh my gosh. And I, I Googled it while we were here. Tom Smikowski is the I, character. I need to came up I with thought about movie. revisiting that movie, but then I'm like, it's going to be too painful. You know, because I remember it came out when I was in college. And I was like, oh yeah, this is hilarious because I'm like, oh, this is all, this is what it's going to be like to be in the working world. And it is what it's like to be in the working world. And it, once you're out of college and in the working world, you're like, oh man, this is not escapist fantasy or something that may happen someday. <laughs> I'm dealing with this. But I, I do need to revisit it. It's a good one. It is. I think we're, we're far enough past early career like the guys <laughs> that uh, we can we can see the brighter side. <laughs> I'm 20 years into my career, so I could probably uh, yeah, dip my toes back into it. Look back and laugh. Well, we do have some great que questions, and thank you um, to everyone who who's entered uh, them. So we'll, we'll answer as many as we can. Um, Jacob, I, I believe you have um, a meeting at the top of the hour, so if you need to jump, we will just wrap it up. But um, so one question from Sarah, thank you, that says, I love the 60-day auto drop idea. Do you have any other metrics around discovery, such as how many attempted contacts are made? Um, and how many communication channels you're using, that type of thing. It's a good question, and we don't. We're still talking through those um, because, especially going into the campaign, we want to be very clear about that. We we do have proposed sunsetting um, criterion that we want to put into place. That um, we also want development officers to have the reporting environment in place where they can quickly see who will potentially be sunsetted. We do have some reports that we built out showing who's on line, in line to be auto drop, but we want to kind of bring all that together because we also want to get some sort of sunsetting in place for folks that are in cultivation status as well. I don't have that criteria in, I can't recall it off the top of my head, but I believe hopefully everybody has my contact information. Um, if not, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I can send what, what's been proposed to you while we're actively discussing. I can also say that we are we're also looking at trying to determine what the average number of contacts, what the average number is to actually get a visit and ultimately to secure a gift. I can say that the folks at Kansas State University Foundation have do. I, I know they've been doing a lot of work in that in that space, so they're they're always great to reach out to. We actually talked to them quite a bit too. So I don't have. I wish I had a better answer for you, but I'm happy to share what we're proposing and what we'd like to put into place. Great, well, we have, Sarah, we have your contact information too. And so um, we, we can follow up with you or, or please do feel free to reach out. Um, here's a question about um, maybe smaller scale change um, for less than maybe a, a huge a CRM conversion. Oftentimes prospect development teams um, do some you know change management within their their smaller office projects any specific tips um, within your prospect development team yeah uh, that's a great question um, the way that I approach that is was really from a um, kind of the job description standpoint um, because what I've found in the past was especially if you're trying to execute meaningful change within the department is if somebody doesn't own something, it's not going to happen. And as much as possible, don't make owning something a jump ball between team members. Either make it a part of a job description or make it a part of your business planning goals. And so what we're doing right now, we I, we, I went through, and it was kind of, as much as possible, I wanted to make it a collaborative experience. <laughs> But I went through and kind of reworked everybody's job descriptions according to these new expected changes. Because like I said at the start of the presentation, we are very much a heavy data management team. And I was like, okay, if we're going to be moving to where it's more of a collaborative partnership, and if we, if we need to get campaign ready, then we have to have, we have to know our new roles, basically. Which seats on the bus do we need to sit in? And also, if there is a kind of a key change item, who is going to own that? Mm. Within our prospect management system, whenever a development officer takes someone on assignment, there is, we call it Highlander rules, which 
I don't know how many people on this call have seen Highlander, but there could be only one. I did not include that team's view. 1986 Christopher Lambert classic, also an underappreciated TV series and syndication too. But anyway, um, we are like, basically, if Catherine was taking Jacob on assignment, Catherine is the primary relationship manager. And so there may be some other folks that are in the assignment team, but there's only one primary relationship manager. So that way, if our president calls and says, hey, Catherine, where are we kind of at with Jacob? That Catherine's the point person that can give the complete story and history and is responsible ultimately for that relationship. By the same token, for each of our projects within the team, there is only one project manager, maybe some people assisting with it, but um, we have a concept within the team called formally assigned still viable prospects, which is a, an acronym for us, FABS, which is not fun to say out loud, but we have a single person that's responsible for those that prospect pool, basically. And yeah, there's those of us that are assisting with that, but she is the one that presents about the status of that, status of that project at team meetings. And if I ever am like, hey, you know, Becky, do you, can you kind of tell me where we're at with this? She knows where we're at with it. We have like a project spreadsheet that where we just basically, it's not very fancy, but we put in last updated, here's a quick one word or two word summary. We call it the elevator pitch status update of the project. And so it all goes back to that concept of ownership. That's how you affect the change. Somebody has to own the change or else it's not gonna happen. Thank you for that. Um, we have a question from Jean. She actually had two. What type of reporting package are you using and what research tools do you use? That's a great question. Research tools in conjunction with Insightful. Uh, <laughs> get that plug out there. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, from a reporting standpoint, we do have dashboards we built within Salesforce, and we use a, we use Ascend, which is a UC Innovation project. By the way, I'll be presenting at the. I don't know if anybody else is an Ascend user on the call, but I'll be presenting on some things along with Jeff Grissel. He'll be presenting too at the user conference in May. But um, we use Tableau pretty heavily. We build dashboards within Salesforce, and we're also examining CRM analytics as well. Um, so we're, we're kind of actively working to build out an efficient reporting environment as we head into the campaign. So that's kind of been getting the, the database stood up was, was kind of like that big initial change. And then it's kind of the other big change was getting, okay, you going back to the survey responses, how we surface the data within the system. We have some really good dashboards we built out, but we also are trying to work around some of the you know, you run into limitations with every tool that you use. How can we get a, kind of like an ultimate dashboard built out? And we're, we're really looking pretty hard at CRM analytics at the moment. So i um, happy to talk through that in more detail uh, offline. In terms of resources, we, uh, we're using um, quite a few. Uh, we actually have um, an automated screening process that we, we've set up through donor search is integrated with the system. I'd be happy to talk to folks about that too. Uh, we use iWave, LexisNexis, a bunch of others as well. So uh, we have a pretty, uh, kudos to the foundation. They invest a lot in us and um, I think we have a pretty, pretty solid uh, environment there. A, a very ro a robust um, systems or systems. To be, I think this is, we have time for one one more question. Um, there's a couple that we we haven't gotten to, but we do commit to getting back to you. But two people asked this, Jacob, if you wouldn't mind sharing um, the average size of your portfolios. Great question. Yeah, well, they were well over a hundred before we went live. Um, now they're around 55. It depends on role. If you're a newer development officer still building out your portfolio, you know, it's 70 to 80, you know, tops is probably, as soon as you're kind of getting close to 100, we, we say you're kind of redlining the engine a bit there. If you're a team lead, a manager, we generally like to look at, you know, if you have a mature portfolio, probably around 55 or so. Mature, I mean, I'm sorry, a team lead that's, you know, they, they're getting pulled a lot of different directions or having to manage several fundraisers. 
we usually like those to top out around 35 or so. Um, and then if you're in leadership, a bit under that. Um, so we definitely put those items into place, really drew down the size of the uh, portfolios. And it is funny because we did have some developed monsters. I don't know if they were slamming a bunch of monster energy drinks at like midnight and wanted to take like, I'm gonna take this entire college's alumni base on assignment, but then that auto drop system <laughs> would come through and kind of clear those out and serve as a governor on, on going a bit overboard on that portfolio. Well, Jacob, thank you so much for these insights and for walking us through it. And it's always good to, to hear stories about coming out on the other side of a big change and um, the, the positive impacts that you've been able to have. Yeah, certainly of course, before, before the implementation, I had like that cow's flowing mane of hair, you know, now, now look at me. But you <laughs> come through the other side just fine. Oh, well, you know, the, all, all the lines are earned, you know. We, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us again. Thank you for being a partner with Insightful. And there are a few other questions. I'll make sure that I get them over to you and that we, we are able to answer them. Um, we are so grateful for everyone's time today. And, you know, at the start of the presentation, I mentioned that Insightful is hosting it. Uh, the session. If you're interested in learning more about Insightful and what, what we do and how we can help you, we, we invite you to learn more. Also invite you to check out our podcast. If you haven't heard of it, it's called No More Raise More, and it's packed with conversations between fundraisers and donors, how they built the relationships. It's real life stories. They talk, there's some turnaround stories, um, connecting with millennial stories, and, and much more. Again, um, in the handout section, you can download this presentation. There's a link, easy to find, um, or you can find it wherever you listen to your podcasts. Again, it's called No More, Raise More. So, thank you, Jacob, again, and thank you to all of our guests. Great questions. We hope this session was valuable and that you have some really actionable ways to help with whatever change management is, is in your future, whether large or small. And if you think of something after today's session, reach out to me, reach out to Jacob. We are here to, to help. We want to be a resource for you. As you exit, please take our brief survey, just three quick questions. Let us know what you thought and how we can improve in the future. So on behalf of Jacob, his team, and the Insightful team, we appreciate you spending part of your day with us. Goodbye.